we're going to focus and continue the theme of the, of the last session, sort of how to access growth funding in the current macro environment. And I guess there's an assumption in there that everyone knows what that means. And it could mean different things if you're a uh, looking at the bank situation or the debt ceiling or uh, the state of VC these days. Um, I have uh, uh, the pleasure of welcoming two great panelists, Blair Silverberg, uh, CEO of Hum Capital, and Puneet uh, Dolakia, is that right? That's right. Of, uh, of Pipe Technologies. Why don't you guys take a minute to just introduce yourselves and what your companies do? Sure, happy to go first. Uh, Puneet Dolakia, uh, I run capital markets for Pipe Technologies. So Pipe is a modern uh, platform built specifically to provide capital, working capital without dilution uh, in a fast and a very efficient way. We initially started off primarily in the SaaS and SaaS-like vertical. Uh, so a lot of companies out here, we've obviously helped them out from a working capital perspective as well. But since then, we've obviously expanded looking at all businesses where we can accurately underwrite uh, the future revenue for the business. So if you just think of a, think of us, right, like we sit in the middle of a lot of the data, uh, generally see a lot of these companies, what are they doing, where are they raising capital, what kind of capital they're getting, in rare instances, what kind of investors they're facing as well. So we do all of that. I'm, I'm Blair Silverberg. I'm the founder and CEO of Hum Capital. Um, we do almost the exact same thing. Uh, the places where we differ, I would say, is... Uh, we, uh, we work with a lot of companies that are non kind of tech companies by nature, so like accounting firms, medical billing companies, freight brokerages. So I have, I have some things I can share about like what the non tech fundraising market looks like. Um, and then, yeah, I'd say the, the target uh, where we tend to operate is the five to $50 million transaction size. So a little bit smaller than like a Goldman Sachs or a major money center bank might participate in, but large enough that a company would struggle to go out and raise friends and family funding to get capital. And then particularly in the banking market that we've seen over the last six to 12 months, it's, uh, it's, it's crazy times for companies in this, this segment to raise capital. So I guess uh, for both of you, how would you characterize the current environment? Uh, you're, you're both dealing in spaces. It's, it's beyond friends and family unless they have extremely good friends and uh, but but not quite series a series B where you get the attention of, of mainstream VC w what is the traditional market for that and how have you seen that change over the last six to twelve months yeah so I think just generally I think the broader theme is like if I looked at the last call it 12 24 months investors across the space whether it's debt investors equity investors and when they're looking at any of these companies they were pricing just capital, not risk. It's the first time after like the post pandemic, they're actually pricing both of them and more so focused on risk and what is the return total gonna look like. So if you just take, let's say just the equity land or the venture land, right? Um, there is capital available, but a lot of these firms have actually chased yields or chased um, you, you know, companies which were in the hyper growth stage, which resulted in now them re requiring to preserve capital at their end. That just generally means that there's obviously lesser capital available for some of these startups, but that does not mean it's the same brush being painted across the, across the space. So if it's, uh, if it's early stage startups, I think it's still a pretty resilient environment because the check sizes tend to be smaller and this just generally, as you've seen over the past few recessions, especially during GFC, some of the best companies get originated or start off in, in kind of like the, uh, the best vintages get originated now, right, during, during a recession. Where there is a little bit of lack of capital, obviously is a growth stage or later stage companies. That's where I would say that, uh, you know, we see firms or lenders, et cetera, they're basically comping them against the public markets as a result of which uh, there's a mismatch between the expectation of these of the, of the firms, of the, of, the, of the companies, versus where the public peers are trading, and so you're probably not going to get your returns. So I think that's, that's generally on the, the landscape on the equity side, and I'll say probably the same, similar things on the debt side, more so post-SVB world, where you know, in, uh, issuers, uh, sorry, lenders or uh, capital providers, especially on the cap private credit side, they are much more focused on the kind of business, the underlying business, the robustness of it, and trying to bifurcate as to who's gonna make it versus not make it. So if you are a business that probably has not done a great job in terms of like providing 
uh, you know, ensuring that there's operation, operational efficiency of the last six to 12 months, that's where you'll probably stumble upon getting the right kind of funding. But the capital, look, I, I think just more broadly, if you look at the facts, right, like right now there's still more capital versus 2019. So sure, 2020 versus 2021, if you look at the money supply, yes, it's probably going down, but there is still capital out there. I think the key is to kind of find the sources of capital and the way you structure that. Same, same question, Blair. I mean, I was gonna go with the Charlie Munger and say, I have, I have nothing more to add. I think that was a fantastic <laughs> answer. So, FinTech specifically versus the rest of the startup world, what are some of the key issues that FinTechs have to deal with, obviously? Uh, regulation, dealing with, uh, you know, well-funded incumbents, trying to find the next great idea. There was a, a talk yesterday that I caught um, in the keynotes, and uh, uh, it, it really touched on, you know, are we beyond the path where, you know, the next big ideas in this industry have all been thought of and exploited? Um, you know, what do you sort of see as the unique challenges for fintech specifically trying to raise money? I, w I would say that um, I, have a I have a lot of thoughts on this. Um, what makes fintech unique is that it's cyclical. So many businesses, many like venture back businesses, they'll go through these secular shifts. So you think about like all the SaaS companies that got started when SaaS became a thing and you could run software centrally in the cloud. Now we're going through another shift where many of those software companies are getting disrupted by the AI version of those companies. So often growing companies will think of, or technology companies will think of these secular episodes where it's possible to create a new company. FinTech, what makes it so different is that, yes, you can create a new company like uh, Alipay when you have mobile phones with payment capabilities for the first time in China. Like that is a secular reason for a new company to exist. But you can also create companies cyclically. So if you think about like, why is it that like Lending Club and Prosper got started in 07 and 08, was it really that you could put loans online or was it just that that's when the last recession occurred and there was a lack of personal capital being lent out to individuals and that was actually a great time to start a consumer lending business. So you have these two kind of confounding ideas uh, and you never really know with a fintech company, is it a, is it a tech company or is it a fin company? It can be really hard to tell from the, the outside because of the cyclical dynamic. If I might just add one thing, right? And you made a great point that some of these businesses tend to be more secular, and when is the likes of Prosper, et cetera, start? They started in 2008. If you look at what's happening broadly in the regional banking space, what happens if these regional banks start pulling off, right? Some of them go under. We have about 4,000 plus banks right now. If they start going under, and we've already seen the impact of SVB, and, and you know, if there are a few of more, more of those that actually go down, who replaces them? Is it just going to be consolidation among some of the top five or six banks, or is it you know, or, and can they move at the same pace that we all are used to seeing? And if that the answer is no, then fintech has a place to a place to a place in the in space. If you have a question, feel free to scan the QR code and put it in. It'll be on our screen here, and we'll be happy to address it. I guess sort of building on that. Uh, are, are fintech investors worried about banks and bank defaults? Uh, it seems like. Obviously, you know, Silicon Valley Bank was a very unique situation, but if, if the government is standing behind the deposits, by and large, of, of, of most, um, if not all, uh, depositors, is that something that sort of weighs on the mind, or is it sort of a macro factor that might lead to another domino falling? I wish I had a crystal ball. I would make a lot of money, but here's what I'd say my thought is, right? I think... The underlying aspect for me for any, when what drives markets is liquidity. So sure interest rates, and we all know what's happened with that. It's obviously been the fastest pace of rate hike, et cetera. But across, if you look at history, it's mainly liquidity. What I get more concerned about with regards to uh, what's happening in the market is just beyond uh, interest rates is that the Fed balance sheet is obviously going lower. In addition to that, which obviously not a lot of people are actually talking about, is the fact that once we have this debt resolution done, there's going to be a ton of bonds that's going to be issued by Treasury as well. That almost creates like a you know, QT squared impact on the broader market. As that happens, liquidity goes down, and then that result has a, has a downstream impact on like debt, equity, et cetera. So I'd say investors, given that we've been in this space for a while, um, most, most investors are aware of this scenario. 
you and if someone like a, like a great like Stan Druckenmiller basically says that I don't know where the bo bodies are buried, then the fact is no one really knows, right? So right. It's, it's kind of an unknown that we really don't know. Blair, do you think that um, when investors think about an investment, a lot of times they're thinking about the exit. Uh, the IPO market has been pretty poor the last uh, 18 months. SPACs, which used to buy the majority of the fintechs and, and sort of accounted for most of the liquidity Don't events exist. for companies out there like, like uh, uh, SoFi and Moneyline and others that have gone public as opposed to the traditional way, uh, ha have dried up also. Is, is, the, is the lack of visibility of an exit affecting the investors that are coming to your site and looking for opportunities? Yeah, I mean, I think that, that the, the lack of visibility to an exit is something that impacts companies like post Series B, Series C the most because there you're at a stage where you can start to calculate how long should it take before this company can go public. And if you don't know that it'll be able to go public, or there's more uncertainty around that, you have to price that in or hold back on investing and be more conservative. Um, the other thing I would just say though that's, that's crazy that we've seen is um, I think the like you were saying, there's 4,000 uh, commercial banks in the U.S. Banks have historically provided a, sta a stabilizing mechanism on pricing. So, like, if you take something like venture debt, venture debt was always, like, prime plus, call it 200 basis points if you raise money from a bank. So let's say that was, like, 7% a year and a half ago. And you're selling, you know, 50 basis points, like half a percent of your company in warrants. Um, and they're very specific, clear underwriting criteria. Commercial banks, like all 4,000 of them, except for the top five or eight, um, are seeing their deposit shrink, and it's almost impossible for them to predict what the end deposit levels will be. And so what that means is they have to be out in the market talking to potential borrowers, because that's how they get customers, is they, they sort of um, pretend to be in the market offering loans. But if you can't predict what your deposits are gonna be, it's impossible to actually offer the loans. So we're seeing a ton of commercial banks that they're out in the market talking to people, but they're not actually funding loans. And with that stabilizing mechanism on price removed, what we're seeing is the non-bank system has like ridiculously wide terms. So there's a company I can think of that, that I was talking to my team about today um, that has three different offers from uh, non-banks. They are refinancing a bank credit facility they have that's effectively being pulled because this particular bank is losing, <laughs> losing deposits and needs to cut back on their risk. And for exactly the same quantum of capital, the three different bids are like 18%, 11%, 14%, everything else is the exact same. And so my team's literally calling around saying like, are you guys talking to each other? Like, do you have any idea what the market price of this particular credit is? So I think that's something that we could take for granted when you have 4,000 banks setting the price. When those banks get removed, you just see a lot of pricing volatility. And unless you can really like canvas the market, you have no idea when you're taking in capital from investors if you're getting a fair price in an environment like this. Uh, what are some of the common mistakes you see companies make at, at this stage of development? And, you know, I think a lot of times you probably see things happening or you, you, you get a, a pitch deck and you, you want to reach through the screen and say, why are you, you know, why do you have six people who are all doing the same thing or why do you have... Uh, too much focus in one area. I guess, what are, what are some of the, the common mistakes that you, that you see all the time? I'd say that the change in mindset probably has happened across 50% of the uh, companies, probably not across 100%, right? So I th when we're in a, in, a, in a space like this where we've not seen for the far past 15 years um, any ripple effect or any kind of recession, the number one thing that most companies forget is liquidity is most important, so you need to have capital. So if you are just going out there with a deck and say and fixated on a specific valuation or a specific number or a dollar, not being creative around structures and sources of capital, keep in mind the last dollar that you raised in your last round is not necessarily where your next dollar is gonna come from. So you have to work harder right now versus like how you worked in the past, right? It might not be necessarily a VC, and maybe that money's drying up, but have you reached out to, let's say, family offices? Have you reached out to asset managers? There's sovereign wealth funds that are actively looking, especially at these prices right now. Have you reached out to this broader market? And same thing goes on structure as well. There are innovative ways that you can actually structure things, both on, let's say, if you are a, f um, a company that probably pr does financial products and is more in the lending business, have you looked at just forward flows? Have you looked at just pass-through? So there are various ways to do that, but I think 
not lacking creativity is where I frankly think the, is, is, is where like most companies make a mistake, especially given what we've been through over the past 15 years. Blair, what do you think? Yeah, I would just say there's, there's some other sources of mistakes. So one is that, um, and I don't know what the right quantum is, but like in, in venture world up until maybe the series A or like middle of the series B, it's all about painting a big vision and getting people excited about what can be in the world. And then there's this like ridiculously binary shift that happens around the series B stage where it's all about saying what you're gonna do, doing that, and then being consistent about doing that over and over and over again. And in a market like this, that shift just happens earlier and it's, it's like being in an abusive relationship in some ways where it's just with, with your capital provider. It's like when the market is good, everything's about the big picture and then like overnight, all of a sudden it's about Wait, what did you say you were gonna do last, last year when you were incentivized to sell the big picture to investors and now the world's changed and you didn't quite do that but you were pitching something that's like ridiculous and impossible to achieve. So like really getting in the habit of like at some place in your company having a plan, saying what you're gonna do and delivering on it and then reflecting on that and getting in that ritual as you operate. If you have that baked into the core of how you're operating your business, you can always skin that to be more or less aggressive depending on the environment, but you never get caught stuck not having that ritual and that discipline in place. That's the biggest mistake I've seen people make is they don't develop that ritual and then when you try to sprint to actually develop it in a bad market, it's basically impossible because it's baked into the people that you hire, the culture you build, the way that you actually build the operation. Um, and so you just can't like fabricate that in a couple months, whereas you can more or less fabricate a bigger vision and a bigger picture that you tell the world externally in a couple months. So I would just flip the order. It sounds like you, you're also touching on communication, right? So you have an investor group uh, that you need to stay in touch with. You need to advise on when things go well, and more importantly, when things don't go as well. And then looking at, you know, who's who's going to be there at my next dollar here, and what sort of expectations am I putting out for them, uh, and will I realistically be able to achieve those, or am I just saying what I need to say to get through the meeting? and then hopefully we'll kind of power through it, um, and, and if not, we'll, we'll, we'll pivot. So it's, it seems like it's also a, just sort of human relations common sense. Yeah. Um, there's a question, uh, we talking about contraction, uh, and, and we're gonna touch on sort of the, the other part of, of exit is M&A, consolidation, uh, firms getting acquired. What, um, do you see that the contraction making buyout candidates more attractive or are rising rates kind of keeping things in check and you don't have this frenzy of, of, of buying things up? I guess when things go on sale, they either get more attractive or less attractive because, I mean, you, you know. M&A happens when valuations are low and IPOs happen when valuations are high, essentially. Big businesses buying other companies get great deals and consumers buying IPOs tend to, <laughs> tend to get screwed at some level. That's why they don't ultimately perform very well um, on average. But um, yeah, absolutely. Like lower valuations are um, a, a leading indicator on M&A events. If I may just add, like it's a cycle at the end of the day, and you see this every cycle when valuations come down. There, are, I think more than buyouts, I, I foresee more of a consolidation in the space. So there might be certain buyouts that are actually appealing and co it complements your business. But if it's just going to be another thing, shiny object that you probably bought at like a very low multiple, that n it, which is not accretive to your business. It probably doesn't make sense. So it's going to be a diff bifurcation between buyouts versus like you just allow them to fail. Um, I guess we have time for one more question. Do you think that management is sometimes uh, kind of loath to give up too much equity up front, and there's sort of this tension of, God, I re we we really want to we really want this check. I don't agree with the valuation. Uh, and I'm going to have to give up too much of my personal stake. Uh, is, is that sort of a natural tension that you, that you see, and is the lower valuation sort of uh, inflaming that? I, and exactly goes back to my mindset question, that you, a lot of them are still in the mindset where they, they're not ready to accept where the valuations are. Keep in mind that the likes of Airbnb or even Facebook, for example, some of the best companies have actually seen a down round or a flat round. So it's not the end of the world as long as you're able to survive and get through this period. A lot of the competitors in, the, in your space might have just been using pricing as a commodity. That no longer exists. So if you're able to survive the next 12 to 24 months, you'll be able to differentiate yourself versus everyone, everyone in the market. Uh, and, and I really hope that you know, most founders actually uh, you realize that that just surviving and not necessarily growing at all costs is not now the new mantra. 
Blair, final word. Um, so, yeah, what's, what's the best topic to deliver the final word on? <laughs> well, what, what do you see the, the future of this? If we're sitting here a year from now, where, what, 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 yeah, what changes, I, what surprises you? Yeah, no, I think, I think the economy is going to get a lot worse because I think that the, like what we saw with PacWest today, like the, the banking sector, like there's 4,000 other banks that can be the next First Republic or Silicon Valley Bank or Signature. So I think it's going to take a while for that to play out. And then as that plays out, then there's going to be a lack of like uh, available capital. There's plenty of capital locked away in private credit and equity funds that's sitting there for somebody to call on, but actually to have the confidence to take it and invest in an environment where prices and, and um, prices are going down, risk is going up. It's kind of like they, they say catching a falling knife. It's a very risky, hard thing to be the first person to go do. Um, and most investors just, good investors just wait. So I think things are going to unfortunately, I'm usually not like a doomsday person, but um, I think things unfortunately are going to get kind of bad. And, um, and uh, yeah, there's all sorts of other like macro geopolitical issues that could happen. So I think it's a very dangerous time, unfortunately. That's a really terrible way to end a panel. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I want to thank our panelists for a great discussion. It was uh, extremely short for the topic we had, but uh, uh, enjoy uh, the rest of your time at, uh, at FinTech Nexus, and, uh, and uh, we'll be hanging around after. Thank you. Thank you.